Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. For announcements, there is no homework due this week, but uh, quiz, for, quiz five, if I can say it, quiz five is due Friday. That is on uh, op, amp, op amp circuits and negative feedback. So take a look at that quiz on Canvas and let me know if you'd like any help after class during office hours. Be sure to enter the VO and the VX numbers in the correct fields on the form. It just shows you know which voltage you're calculating. So there are two voltages defined, VO and VX, and you'll enter those um, on the form to submit. Prelab 8 is due this week, and then you'll start working on Prelab 8. That is on Canvas. My office hours are right after class if you'd like to talk about anything. So stop by uh, if you'd like to chat. So what I wanted to start out with today was actually um, an elaboration on a question I got during office hours. We're talking about op amps, operational amplifiers, and we were talking about linear circuits that you can create out of operational amplifiers using negative feedback. Okay, and so uh, you know, the, the topic of discussion was roughly, how do you know what voltages to use? How do you, how do you know uh, what kind of gain do you want? Why would you even use these circuits? So I wanted to give an example of using an op amp circuit in a very practical application. And this is that application. So this, this is an application that I think is very relevant to mechanical engineers. And the topic is sensing and measurement. So sensors or transducers take physical quantities, temperature, um, strain, pressure, uh, you know, what else, uh, uh, light intensity, and convert those physical quantities or use those physical, physical quantities to create an electrical signal that represents those physical quantities. So for example, if you have a sensor, you might, you might have a sensor to, to measure temperature. One of those temperature sensors might be a thermocouple. There are different types. There are silicon-based um, temperature sensors, uh, thermistors, things like that. And you might use those in testing. Um, I, I put this picture in here. This is, a, this is a really neat test of a fighter jet engine. I think it was an F-16 engine down at Buckley uh, at, at the time. And I actually took this picture. This, I was standing, I don't know, you know, tens of feet from this engine as they were testing it and then went into afterburner. And it was a really amazing experience to stand right next to that engine running for many seconds in afterburner. But it got me thinking about uh, what, what would you need to sense if this engine is working properly, right? You'd need temperature sensors, you'd need pressure sensors, you'd probably want some accelerometers and vibration sensors to make sure everything's running properly. So a thermocouple is a type of temperature sensor that measures uh, a wide range of, of temperatures. And then I did not take this photo, but this is the test of an airliner with its wings bent up to do a, to do a stress test on the wings. And so to, you could, you could bet there were strain gauges and load cells that, that measured, um, measured tension and compression all throughout this setup. And so this is another type of sensors. There's, there's, there's a lot of different types of sensors, but, but the point is you connect the electrical world to the mechanical world in a useful way with, with sensors. And many, off, many times, often, you want to collect that data for either a test or characterization, or maybe in an application that uses that sensor data in a feedback loop um, to control some parameter. If you're just doing a test, you might use some kind of voltage logging equipment that takes a voltage and logs it to disk, and you can, you can observe what happens over time, maybe plot it. Um, that's, that's a common application. And you can take a uh, or, or a controller, like a microcontroller, take in that voltage, sample it, and respond to what happens. You might control fuel flow or, or the, the fuel air mixture based on, um, based on temperature, right? So this could be used in a real-time application in a feedback loop. Okay, so here's where the op amp comes in. These sensors often have very low, very small output voltages or, or currents. 
for thermocouples and load cells, you might get a change of only a millivolt or two, or maybe up to 10 millivolts. And usually these data acquisition systems or even analog to digital converters for controllers have ranges of volts, maybe a couple volts, maybe five volts. So if you have a, a range of zero to 10 millivolts, <laughs> excuse me, and uh, out of your sensor, and then you have a range input to your data acquisition device of zero to five volts, that's a that's a big mismatch. That that data acquisition device or analog to digital converter has a finite resolution that it can measure. It might only measure in increments of 10 millivolts. So if you go zero to 10 millivolts out of the sensor, you're not getting a lot of resu any resolution really um, that you'd be logging to disk or using to control your system. So in comes the need for an amplifier circuit. And so this is what we've been talking about. For example, an operational amplifier circuit like the inverting amplifier or the non-inverting amplifier that multiplies the input voltage by a gain, and you get an output voltage. So you can turn this range over here right, to this range over here. And so here's an op amp chip that, that could do that. Um, you know, it, it has, let's look at from the perspective of the amplifier circuit, it has an input voltage and an output voltage. And so you could calculate what kind of gain you would need. This voltage gain, A sub V, that we've been talking about, um, if you wanted to scale 10 millivolts up to 5 volts, the gain would be 5 over 0.01, which would be 500. Okay, so that's the kind of gain that those are the resistor. That's the resistor ratio you would use for, let's say, your non-inverting amplifier circuit to turn 10 millivolts into five volts. So you can expand that range to cover all the levels of your data acquisition device or controller's converter here. There are other limitations we're going to talk about. For example, you would need a voltage range out of this amplifier circuit that could cover zero to five volts. And that depends on the power supply voltages. We'll talk about that in just a minute, actually. Okay, so so this is a this is a practical reason to use op amps to create amplifiers if you, if you need to create one yourself to amplify or even shift in levels at an offset uh, from from something like a sensor that has a much different range of voltage than the data acquisition device, which might have a bigger range. Okay, so that's a practical application. And to uh, talk about a, a very specific application, um, this is this is a project I'm working on, just a an outside project to try to measure um, the loading on a wing using using strain gauges. They're used for this. This isn't unusual, um, but just trying to use this on a general aviation aircraft. And so, uh, what I did is I created just a a test setup to experiment with the with the strain gauge. So here's a block of wood with a piece of aluminum, which is maybe eighth of an inch, sixteenth of um, three thirty seconds, maybe thick by maybe I don't know half an inch. And these are strain gauges here. Um, if you've worked with them, you might recognize them. So on the top, there are a couple strain gauges. Right here are two terminals on each strain gauge. On the bottom, you can't see it in this picture, but under the beam, there are a couple other strain gauges. So I have four strain gauges in order to sense the bending of that um, of that beam, of that aluminum bar there. Um, again, it's trying to test, see how much flex I need to, to I can measure um, if this were a wing spar or the, these strain gauges were on a wing spar. And to measure, so the changes in resistance of those strain gauges is really small. As you bend this bar down just a little bit, um, these strain gauges on top stretch a little bit. They get put into um, tension. The strain gauges on the bottom squeeze together a little bit. They get, there's, uh, there's compression of those strain gauges. And you can't really see it here too well, but, but the, um, uh, the, uh, there's resistive material here that gets expanded or compressed, and the resistance changes by fractions of ohms. It's really small. So in order to measure that, um, we would uh, use something like a Wheatstone bridge, right? You might recognize this from a from a homework problem. This is a practical circuit to use. 
it's very useful when I have four resistances that change two in one direction, two in another direction as I bend this beam, for example. And then I apply a, a source voltage VS, and then this output voltage changes just a little bit. It's actually just a few millivolts. Okay, so uh, so these these strain gauges um, can be uh, connected to in this Wheatstone bridge configuration to produce a very small output voltage. That output voltage right here you can see is about 1.5 millivolts. It's on the millivolt scale. I'll show you a demo of this in just a second. But so this is an op this is an op amp circuit. This is what we're working on in class right now. This is why I say they're useful because you can take that really small voltage that changes a few millivolts and convert it into a, a voltage that spans many volts. Okay, so a few millivolts span to many volts span. And that's what this amplifier does. This, is, this particular circuit is not an inverting or a non-inverting amplifier circuit that we covered. It's called an instrumentation amplifier circuit. It takes two inputs, takes the difference, multiplies it by a controllable gain, has a very high input impedance, so you don't, so you don't change, so you don't affect the uh, the voltage divider action of these um, of these resistors here, and it produces a big output. Okay, so um, so all these different kinds of sensors, pressure sensors, light sensors, strain gauges, load cells. Um, what else we got there? Um, temperature sensors. They all usually have very very small voltage changes that you want to amplify. Um, we're not going to we're not going to get into how these work in this class. There's just not enough time. If you're interested in sensors and circuits that make these sensors work, uh, check out the class, the electronics class I'm teaching for the fall, because we're going to cover all these types of sensors and and do some labs with the sensors and do a control loop, as I mentioned a few classes ago. And we're actually going to connect to a microcontroller. So this is going to be the wind load measurement application software that um, runs on an Arduino and um, reports, tries to convert that to G loading of the, of the aircraft based on the strain gauge output. So fun things you can do with um, sensors, if you can build op amp circuits, right? If you know just a little bit about op amp circuits to convert one small signal into a signal that becomes useful. Uh, just as a as a kind of a interesting demo, I think here. Um, so so this is that circuit you should be able to see on the screen now, and you can see real time that here's the beam, right? This is the input voltage here. That's the very small voltage. It says 1.5 millivolts at this point. This says 2.47 volts. That's actually midpoint of uh, of the range of the input and output, roughly midpoint. And so if you push down on the beam, you'll see the voltage, both voltages go up. You pull up on the beam, voltages go down. And, and just note the deflection. You probably can just barely see the deflection just to show how sensitive these strain gauges are. You put a, I got a calibrated battery here, right? Just a weight, just as a weight. And so I, I went from, what was the initial voltage? The initial voltage is about 1.5 millivolts at the input, roughly 2.5 at the output, and then put a small weight on it. Again, barely any deflection, and you see went up to 2.3 millivolts at the input. So that's 0.8 millivolts change, right, from that weight. That's 800 microvolts change. And so that that's really not really detectable directly by most data acquisition devices without an amplifier. But you can, you can see the output went from, what, about 2.5 volts up to about 4 volts. So it changed 1.5 volts. And, and you know, great, it's a scale. It's really measuring deflection of the, of the beam right here. But um, so, so if you want to be able to make very sensitive measurements using strain gauges or other sensors that have very small outputs, that's where op amps come in to be able to make circuits like that and, uh, and, and, and make those outputs into useful, uh, useful signals. Okay. 
Um, again, if you're interested in talking about that, I'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, stop by office hours. If you're interested in learning more about um, sensors and circuits for sensors and microcontrollers and all the ways you can use those, uh, check, out, check out the fall class for electronics for mechanical engineers called Practical Electronics. So, but that's the motivation for talking about op amp circuits and linear amplifiers. What I just showed is a linear amplifier application. It's a linear circuit multiplying one voltage by a value, offsetting it, and then getting another value. Um, and if we look at our decision tree for op amps that I like to follow, So when I started talking about op amps, I said, well, this is the decision tree. We haven't talked about negative feedback yet. We have now. Um, so oh, I'll get my arrow here. So now I think you know enough to use this tree. So if you have an op amp circuit that has negative feedback, you go down the branch on the left that's what I'm calling a linear op amp circuit. And you use neg the negative feedback approach, input differential voltage gets driven to zero, input currents into the op amp or zero, use KVL, KCL, Ohm's law to analyze the circuit, and you get something like gain or output voltage or some current within the circuit. Once you've analyzed a common circuit like an inverting amplifier or a non-inverting amplifier, then you know the gain. You don't have to analyze it using negative feedback, uh, the negative feedback approach again. The gain of a inverting amplifier is negative feedback resistor over the series resistor to the input, right? So, so now that's what I'm calling a common circuit. Okay, so this is the break where we go down the right side of the tree. The right side of the tree is well, what if you have no negative feedback? What might that op amp circuit be and what might it be useful for? Well, that's called a comparator. If you have no negative feedback in this class, you're going to see that circuit is going to be a comparator circuit. A comparator circuit compares two voltages and lets you know uh, which voltage is higher, lets the circuit know which voltage is higher. So why would that be useful? A thermostat, for example, is the temperature higher than a set point? Uh, turn the heat off. Is the temperature lower than a set point? Turn the heater on. Okay, so we're going to look at two kinds of comparators in this class. We're going to look at just a basic simple comparator, which will compare two voltages with a single threshold. And then we're going to look at a comparator with hysteresis. This uh, comparator with hysteresis has two thresholds, and I'll show you why that's important. So these uh, comparator circuits um, actually take advantage of a limitation of op amps. So we're going to talk out talk about op amp limitations, and then I will point out what limitation is useful for. Um, using as a comparator. Okay, so let's talk about op amp limitations. Okay, so the first limitation, this is the useful limitation for us, is the output voltage swing. So the output of an op amp must be between its power supply voltages. Kind of makes sense. Um, to dig into that a little bit, here is an op amp with the inputs on the left, the output on the right, and the power supply voltages. VCC is the positive supply voltage. VEE is the negative supply voltage. This limitation in the practical world in lab is that the output has to fall between the negative supply and the positive supply voltage. Okay, so so if I have um, a negative supply of negative 15 volts and a positive supply of positive 15 volts, the output can't go outside of those. It can't go to 16 volts or negative 16 volts. 
the output has to fall between those. So that's that's a limitation, but we're going to use that as a feature for comparators. And there's usually some margin between the output voltage V out and the power supply voltages. Um, and so, so what's that mean? That means that, well, for cheap op amps especially, you can't get V out to go all the way up to VCC really close, and you can't get V out to go all the way down to negative, well, VEE um, really close. There's always some margin there. For example, on the LM324, I think this is the one you have in your kit. If you have plus 15 volts connected to VCC, minus 15 volts connected to VEE, then and you build an amplifier, and you connect 2K ohms as a load to the output, then you're actually going to see a 26 volt swing. So up to maybe plus 13 down to negative 13, right? There's going to be a couple volt margin there that because of the way the op amp works with those transistors that I showed, um, you're not going to be able to hit the power supply voltages. There's going to be some margin. Um, and that depends on your load resistance that you connect to the output. For example, for 10K ohms, you can get closer to the output. You can swing closer. Um, and, oh, oh, okay, so yeah, yeah. So this is, it, it. you can actually connect VEE to ground. So if you connect um, VEE to ground, you can get down really close to ground, but you can't get up to the um, 30 volt power supply. But that that's the the voltage range of 30 volts. You can, you can have it span, um, 30 volts by having a negative VEE voltage and a positive VCC voltage. Okay. For more expensive op amps, if you need if, if you need to go, if you need to get closer to those power supply, they're called rails. Um, the power supply rail, uh, the power supply rails of an op amp are the power supply voltages. Right. The rail means you can't go outside the rails. Um, there are op amps that are a little more expensive called rail to rail op amps. And they let you get really close to VCC and VEE for a couple bucks more. Um, so that, that, but that's a limitation. That's a limitation of an op amp that the output voltage has to be between the power supply voltages. Okay. Um, there's also a current limit. We just talked about a voltage limit. This is a current limit. So the currents out of and into an op amp's output are limited to a maximum value. Here's what I mean by that. This is the output current of an op amp I out. And so an op amp can have current coming out and that's a source of current and it can also sink current. It can have current going in. And so the uh, a positive I out, right, current coming out of the op amp is going to be less than some I source max. And a negative I out, which would be current going into the op amp, right, the absolute value of that's going to be less than some I sink max. Source means outputting current, sink means taking current in. Okay, and so so that's that's reasonable, right? An op amp can only output or take in source or sink, some maximum current levels. So you can design for that, but you also have to take into consideration the feedback path. So remember, we have some kind of feedback path in linear amplifiers. This was a, you know, a resistor going somewhere. There was current going through that resistor. So some of that output current of the op amp is used in the feedback path so that um, you can get negative feedback. So in your design, when you're doing your op amp design in lab, you have to take that current into account. That's a reason. Remember I said, okay, in the future, we're going to talk about it's not just the ratio of resistors that's important. I mean, that's important. That sets the gain for these op amp circuits, the linear op, linear op amp circuits. But, the, um, but the, the, the values, the actual values of those resistors, right? 1 ohm, 10 ohms, 100 ohms, 10K ohms, it matters because you don't want to use really small resistors in your feedback path. If you use really small resistors by Ohm's law, you'll get a lot of current flowing through the feedback path, which you don't want because that 
uses the capacity of your maximum output current. Okay. So to give you an idea of, this is out of the data sheet for the LM324. The LM324 for these power supply ranges um, can source between 10 and 20 milliamps, okay? Or sync between five and eight milliamps. Well, I'll say typical 20, source minimum 10, guaranteed 10. On sync current, typical eight milliamps into the op amp, minimum five milliamps into the op amp. So if you wanted to control, let's say a motor or a really bright LED with a hundred milliamps of current or more, you could not use this op amp to power the motor or the LED, right? To light it up, you'd have to use a transistor, okay? So that's why we talked about transistors. And we'll talk more about that when we get to microcontrollers. So you need to consider the current required by the load connected to the output of the op amp, the, the resistance or whatever you have connected. And you also have to consider the current through the feedback path when designing an op amp circuit. Okay, so because there's a maximum I out, there's a maximum output current. That's the output current limit. Okay, so we have a voltage limit, we have a current limit, and you just have to stay within those limits. Um, there's a slew rate limitation. That's an odd word, slew rate. So the rate of change of output voltage is limited to a maximum value. That maximum value is called the slew rate. So the maximum value that an output voltage can change over time is called the slew rate. And so uh, it's specified in volts per second or volts per microsecond. So this is the derivative, dv dt, dv out dt. This is the derivative, the slope of the output voltage. Okay, so it can only change at a certain rate. And so if you have an output that changes with time, maybe this is an audio amplifier, right? A value changing with time. Then the, the derivative of the output voltage, dv out dt, right? Positive or negative value. That's why we we're taking the absolute value here. Has to be less than or equal to this slew rate. So as a, as a cartoon of what's happening here, if I had right, right at time zero, right here at the axis, right? So this is v out versus time. And so right at time zero, if I had some signal that went at a slope lower than the slew rate, that's just fine. If I have an output signal, output voltage that's trying to rise faster than the slew rate, it will be limited to the slew rate. Okay, so your signal will get distorted. So if you if you have an audio signal that's run that's operating at a high frequency, right? Because the um, uh, a high frequency sine wave has a steep slope at the zero crossing. Uh, that that audio frequency might get distorted if you're trying to exceed the slew rate of the op amp. And you can convert slew rate to to maximum frequency given a given an output voltage. And so again for the 324 LM324 op amp, the slew rate is 0.5 volts per microsecond. Uh, that's 500,000 volts per second. So it's, it's a slope. So 500,000 volts per second. It's not a big voltage. It's it's a big uh, it's a big slope. And voltages that you would try to get out of the op amp, you know, changing voltages, time varying voltages, with a higher rate would be distorted. So again, something you have to take into account when you're when you're designing an op amp circuit. Okay. All right, so those are the, the limitations of an op amp that are, that are practical if you're trying to build an audio amplifier or drive some kind of high power device using an op amp or, um, or trying to output a big voltage signal. That voltage limitation, the output voltage swing is what we're going to use in the design of comparators. Okay, so, Here's that tree again. I keep bringing this tree up. Right? We talked about this. We're going down the path of comparators to talk about the simple comparator first, and then we'll we'll talk about the comparator with hysteresis. 
So going down that right side there, as I mentioned, a comparator compares two voltages. That's what it does. It has two inputs. It compares those two voltages. It gives you an output that is either high or low. And roughly described, don't pay attention to the parent. Uh, don't per pay attention to the the set of parentheses right here. I'll tell you why. If uh, so, roughly described, the output will be high. For example, five volts. If an input voltage exceeds a threshold voltage, and then it'll be low, for example, zero volts, if the opposite is true. That's one way you can make a comparator work. Or you can make it work the opposite way. That's what the parentheses are here. The output would be high if the uh, input voltage falls below a threshold voltage, and then low if the opposite is true. Uh, it'll. It makes more sense to look at the circuit and write numbers than describe in word. But roughly described, you're comparing two voltages and out of the op amp, you either get a high or a low, depending upon how those voltages compare. Well, this is useful. This, this lets you design an electronic circuit that makes decisions. Right? Is the temperature too high? Is the temperature too low? Is the pressure too high in a compressor? So throw a safety valve, right? Is, a, is, a pre is the pressure too low? Turn the motor on on the compressor. So that's what comparators let you do. Compare, for example, sensor outputs um, or, or, or input voltages to, to a set point and then react, do something, control something. So let's, let's dig into how comparators work. Let's look at how you create a comparator using an op amp. So we'll switch over to the whiteboard here. OK. So a comparator can be made out of an op amp. And actually, an op amp just alone is a very good comparator. So if I take an op amp, and I just draw the op amp with its inputs and power supply voltages. This is VCC. This is VE. This is V out. This is V1 as we've defined it in this class. This is V2. Okay. Um, so let's suppose you just power this op amp with five volts VCC and zero volts VEE or ground. So we do that. And so what would you expect? You'd expect this this op amp to have a V out that is AOL times V1 minus V2. Right? That's how we started the discussion on op amp. That's what an op amp does. It's a high gain differential amplifier. It takes the difference between voltages V1 and V2, multiplies it by a big number. And AOL is usually 10,000, 100,000, maybe up to a million. I'm going to use 10 to the 6. That's a little big, but 10 to the 6, just so I can make my numbers easier here. OK. All right. So let's suppose we have this op amp with AOL equals 10 to the 6, and we can apply input voltages V1 and V2. Let's make a table. So we have this table V1, V2, and then let's see what happens for V out. Let's suppose I apply, I take a power supply, two power supplies, and I apply four volts to V1, and I apply three volts to V2. Okay, let's see what comes out of the output. Well, in the ideal theoretical op amp, you would get AOL times V1 minus V2. So I would get AOL 10 to the sixth times V1 4 minus V2 3. So 10 to the sixth times one, 
I would have a million volts at the output of that op amp. Okay, so that should bother you, <laughs> right? That should bother you because remember the output voltage swing limitation that the output cannot go higher than VCC and it cannot go lower than VEE. Okay. And let's imagine this is a rail to rail op amp. So VCC can go as high as just about five volts and VEE, VEE can go as low as well, just about zero volts there. Okay, so as you apply these voltages, this output starts rising to try to get to a million volts and it hits the limit, five volts. So that's not going to happen. You're going to get about five volts at the output with these two inputs, okay? Now, let's imagine you take uh, V1 and you change it to two volts and you leave V2 at three volts. Then V out is going to be AOL times V1 minus V2, or it's going to try to be, right? So that's going to be negative a million volts at the output. But we know that the output voltage cannot go lower than VEE. So that's not going to happen. It cannot go to, to a negative a million volts. As the output starts dropping down toward negative a million it's going to hit the limit of zero volts. Remember, ground is zero volts here. Okay. So, so here's here's what happens that um, you get this you get this function out of just an op amp that is powered, such that if V one is greater than V two, V out is equal to V C C, right? If V1 is less than V2, V out equals approximately VEE. And so that's that's what a comparator does. That's how a comparator works with an op amp in the center of the circuit. We'll look at different variations, but um, so, so generally a V out equals um, VCC approximately, I'll put approximately there, VCC for V1 greater than V2 and approximately VEE for V1 less than V2. Okay, so now you have the circuit that can compare two voltages and tell you at the output which one is larger and then go do something with that, like create a thermostat. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this right here? I'll talk about an application of a thermostat next, but any question? If they're equal, then wouldn't it also be zero out? Yeah, right. Yeah, what happens if you have V1 equals to equal four volts and three in V2 equal four volts? Like what happens right there? In practical, so yes, you're exactly right. If you could make these voltages exactly equal to the microvolt, you could get zero out. But But the... But the problem is, um, if if you look at the voltages in your circuit, you typically have noise that exceeds many microvolts. Okay, so it would actually be very hard to get V1 equal to V2 and not have any kind of noise um, on on the circuit. And usually, the the voltages you're you're comparing are different by more than just a few microvolts, right? So for example, if I had, if I had just a 10 microvolt difference, um, you know, 10 microvolts would try to bring uh, V out up to 10 volts. It can't go to 10 volts. It would be limited to five volts, right? Or if I had negative 10 microvolts difference, it would try to go to negative 10 volts. And so you'd have not negative 10 volts, but zero volts. So yes, there's this really narrow band and I'll, I'll actually use an example to show that when you're crossing the threshold, you can get you can get multiple transitions. That's actually a problem for this kind of comparator. So my answer is yes, if you could make these voltages equal, you could get zero volts out. Practically, um, I would challenge you to do that in lab. You'll see you, you, you can't really do that. Um, and so it's not really a practical 
condition um, for using comparators. Okay, so so let's suppose you have you want to make a a thermostat. So you take a temperature sensor. And that temperature sensor has an output voltage. It has some kind of voltage that is proportional to temperature. Okay, V is proportional to temperature. And then let's suppose over here you have a heater. And it has a control signal going in. And it has a voltage going in that maybe when this voltage is five volts, the heater turns on. When that voltage is zero volts, the heater turns off. Okay. In the middle, you can put a comparator to control this system. Okay. And so the comparator will decide based on some set point, I'm going to do, I'm going to put a set point over here. Let's see if I can fit this uh, set point. That's the temperature at which you want to hold the room. And so it's, it's also some voltage that represents a temperature. All right. Okay. What would this look like on on a plot? Let's see. Looks like my monitor, my my the monitor that I used to monitor class on Zoom just cut out. Someone shoot me a chat to make sure that I'm actually still getting out to anybody, please. Okay, let's see. I think I had a failure of Zoom on this end. <laughs> looks like looks like looks like I've, I've got it set up to, uh, to 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 change hosts. So you can yeah, if you want to teach, you're welcome to teach. But let me uh let me get the Zoom set up here. That's odd. We can see the board. Okay, great. Okay, good. Um, I lost my chat window though. Okay, someone shoot me a chat so I can, you can confirm, you can hear me. Shoot anything, great. I see the, I see it. Okay, so we have uh, what I'm gonna call an, an input voltage here to the comparator VN and an output voltage V out of the comparator. And so, so what would that look like if I plot V out versus V in? So here's, here's what I want this comparator to do. When the temperature is low down here, when the temperature is low, so V into the comparator is low, right? This, this voltage is low because the temperature is low. I want the heater on. And so I want the output to be high so the heater's on. And then I'm going to define a, a set point, which is some reference voltage. I'm going to call that V ref, V R E F. It's a voltage against which I'm comparing this input voltage. Okay. And so as the temperature of maybe the house goes up, right? The heater stays on until the voltage hits V ref. And then that means the house is warm enough, the heater shuts off. And then maybe the sun, see, uh, the sun heats up the house and maybe the temperature goes even higher, but the heater is going to stay off. So this is the kind of characteristic you want 
this comparator to implement. You want some kind of set point that sets this reference value, this V ref. And when V in is less than V ref, you want the heater on. And when V in is more than V ref, you want the heater off. So that's the characteristic we want in, in a comparator. And that's called an inverting comparator because when the input is low, the output is high. When the input is high, the output is low. So let's talk about an inverting comparator. Okay. So we're going to make this comparator using an op amp and I'm going to connect the input here and I'm going to call this the reference voltage here. And, and, and you can see when, so when, when V in is greater than V ref, right? It, it follows this output voltage here, right? You're gonna get VCC and VEE depending upon if V in is greater than or less than V ref. So V in comes from your temperature sensor and V ref, um, comes from your set point. So what I have to do is I have to connect VCC to a power supply voltage. Right? This is V out here. I have to connect VEE to ground if I want zero at the output, right, right here. And then I can set V ref. Let's suppose I want to keep something at a fixed temperature. I could actually use two resistors to create a voltage divider. Right? And this voltage divider, like in one of your homeworks or quizzes, we, we talked about this. Now you can you can use a voltage divider to set this voltage V ref between five volts and zero volts. If you want, you could change this out for a potentiometer and, um, and have this adjustable. Now you have an adjustable thermostat or a thermostat with an adjustable V ref, an adjustable set point, okay? So, and V ref would equal, uh, well, let's do this. Let's connect five volts together since this is the same voltage. And now that's VCC. VCC is five volts. V ref is equal to VCC times R2 over R1 plus R2. Right? Voltage divider creeping in here again. And so now we have implemented this characteristic down here with this circuit. V out equals roughly. Let's see. Uh, VCC for V in less than V ref. That's where the heater turns on and VEE zero volts when V in is greater than V ref, right? Where VCC is going to be five volts, VEE is going to be zero volts. So this is a basic this is a basic thermostat um, using a comparator. You could set the set point using the ratio of resistors in the voltage divider formula, or again, use a use the potentiometer circuit that we talked about in class and that you built in lab um, to have a varying reference voltage to control the set point of the thermostat. Okay, remember one of your homework problems, you had a voltage divider where if you actually took current out of the voltage divider, um, that, that messed up the ratio. Well, here, remember, remember op amps have high impedance inputs, so approximately zero amps goes that way. So you can truly use a voltage divider here. All right. Okay. So um, – there is another component that I'm going to add here, and I'll talk about this next time. This works. This circuit works uh, using a regular op amp and considering the output voltage swing limitations. 
I'm going to show you there's a there's an integrated circuit that is meant specifically to be a comparator where you're going to have to add another resistor here. And I'll show you why that is uh, next time. And that's the comparator integrated circuit that you actually have in your kit. So we'll talk about that next time so you can get that going in lab. Okay, but for now, it looks like I hit the wall on time. Um, so remember, quiz five is due Friday. Pay attention to V0 and VX or VO and VX where they where they go in the form. Pre-lab eight is due this week, and then you'll start lab eight this Friday. Uh, thanks for joining class. If you'd like to join me at office hours, please stick around. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.